Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Today we have something interesting that I wanted to try out via Patreon viewer's choice. See, while of course I would prefer this show stick to comic books, the truth is people have wanted to see me riff on or give opinions about various pieces of media. They want me to talk about their favorite stuff, get me interested in the same things they are. Anime, movies, franchises, etc. And that's fine. If I wasn't okay with it, I wouldn't let patrons do it. I mean, let's face it, I'm a windbag and won't shut the hell up about my opinions. But therein lies the problem. I have lots of thoughts about various pieces of media, but no real out outlet for it other than, like, a massive Twitter thread, and I can't monetize that. It takes a lot of time to produce a scripted video on something that goes in-depth on stuff, so it's hard to just be a one-off unrelated to my main shows either. So here we are, me full of opinions on stuff like say, classic Doctor Who episodes, and no place to do it meaningfully. Except, of course, for those Patreon-sponsored episodes. So instead of doing a Patreon viewer's choice of three comic books to cover, I chose three fourth Doctor serials that I have plenty to talk about. Invasion of Time, State of Decay, and Legopolis. And the people have spoken, choosing the final outing of Tom Baker as the fourth Doctor, Legopolis. Depending on how this goes, especially with content ID, I might do another one of these down the line, probably one focused on Dalek and Cybermen stories. I left those out because I feared putting any of them on there would dominate the poll. But yeah, Legopolis. I'm assuming most people watching this are already familiar with what Doctor Who is, and while Classic Who normally isn't really too big when it comes to ongoing stories and continuity, this episode requires a bit of context to it, both in-universe and out. Out of universe, this being Tom Baker Baker's last episode of Doctor Who was significant. He held the role for seven years, longer than any other Doctor, new or old, unless you count the wilderness years anyway. Point is, the popularity of his time on the show basically made him the definitive Doctor, one referenced and thought of by the public until the modern series came along. And thus ending his time on the show needed a story that was big. A chance for the Doctor to be a hero to the universe, show off why he was so great, and pit him against a worthy adversary. And that's where we move into the in-universe context. This adventure follows directly on from the previous one, the Keeper of Traken. Long story short, the Doctor is summoned to a planet called Trocken, where his longtime enemy, the Master, is trying to gain access to a powerful energy source. The Master, or as one might call him in this story, Captain Crispy, has used up all of his regenerations and wants to steal the Doctor's remaining incarnations for himself. However, before he can complete his plan, he's foiled by the Doctor's companion, Adric, with the help of some locals named Tremus and his daughter Nyssa. However, the Master managed to escape death and, still retaining some of the power he had acquired and desperate for a new body, stole Tremus's. Tremus's name, of course, being an anagram of Master, because Doctor Who takes subtlety and beats it to death like Ace to a Dalek. I guess stealing someone's body automatically resets their beard length on the character creation screen. And that's where we start things off with this story. Legopolis is a moody, exciting, fascinating, atmospheric, worthwhile ending to the fourth Doctor's run. And it makes absolutely no sense when you stop and think about it for five seconds. Let's dig into Legopolis and unpack that statement. <laughs>
For those unfamiliar with Classic Who, I should note that back in the old days, Doctor Who episodes were not single 40 to 60 minute adventures, but rather serialized multi-parters, usually around four to six half hour episodes for a single story. It's the equivalent of watching a movie a sometimes boring one because they could be filled with padding. Preferably running back and forth across a rock quarry if they could book it that week. And let's start out with our theme song, which had premiered at the beginning of this season and replaced the familiar time tunnel one that had been the fourth Doctor's since his start. I recall this theme song once being described as being pulled kicking and screaming into the 80s, with heavy guitar, the star field forming into the Doctor's face, the redesigned logo that kind of looks like a neon sign, it is so remarkably different than what had ever come before on the show. It is a good rockin' theme song, but it does not fit Tom Baker's doctor at all. And really, his facial expression in it kinda says it all. Confusion and mild wincing. It's weird, though, because it actually does match up with Peter Davison's Doctor, even though it's not like the stories became so much more 80s-tastic or rock and roll themed or anything. It's just Tom Baker's Doctor has always had this bohemian, kind of weathered look. Sometimes the show had more gothic sensibilities, making, of course, the gothic horror evident in some earlier stories and even one of the other options for the Patreon vote, State of Decay. And this theme does not match up with it at all. Hell, it doesn't even match up with the music of this episode, which is something else I'll be talking about later. No, instead we begin with an unusual sight for this show, a police box being used by a policeman. Which, considering the police box is the most iconic object of the show, you'd think would be happening more often. However, his phone call is interrupted by something. In particular, another TARDIS materializing over the police box. Not sure why I didn't cut the phone cord when it did, but whoever is inside decides to rectify this by yanking the policeman inside and laughing. A visual representation of deep diving through a very thoroughly researched fan wiki. We cut to the inside of the Doctor's TARDIS to an area called the Cloister Room. This very nice stone structure with vines and stuff growing in it. Classic Who visited other areas of the TARDIS about as much as the new series. That is, not often. Usually just some hallways, but it's always neat when we did. Helped to make the place a more lived-in space. Adric comes looking for the Doctor, who's kind of stream of consciousness rambling about several topics. He tells Adric that if he wanted to signal him, he could use the Cloister Bell, which is basically the TARDIS's red alert system. It's another thing that carried over into the new series, but got its start in this episode. Legopolis actually has a lot of lore drops about the TARDIS, about the Doctor's own past, but they're mostly in passing and not dwelled on. And that's appreciated. In my opinion, the Doctor's past should be mysterious and unknown. It's why I'm not fond of the Timeless Child revelation, which I will not spoil for you if you haven't seen it. I feel it just gives a definitive answer about the Doctor that I really didn't want to have. The ambiguity and mystery are better than knowing for certain. Well, that because it raises a bunch of continuity issues. Although it's Doctor Who, continuity in this show is like a bag of checks mix. The writers at any given time just pick and choose which bits they want to have and ignore the rest. And if you're wondering why I suddenly had a tangent about that, well, like I said, windbag, lots of opinions. And this is my chance to express them while making money. Hopefully. Anyway, the Doctor essentially says that the TARDIS is getting old and things are starting to break down, echoing the essence of the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy increases. And this is actually an important detail because entropy is a big part of this episode. One problem, though, the story treats entropy the same way that Zero Hour Crisis in Time treated it. Wrong. It treats entropy as a force, like some kind of infection that needs to be combated or defeated. Entropy, in terms of science, is just the increasing loss of energy as atoms and molecules become more spread out. Or, put in layman's terms, the longer something goes, the less steam it has to keep going. Which makes me wonder if that was on the minds of the people making the show at the time. Doctor Who had been on the air for almost 18 years at this point, which is not something that a lot of shows can boast, and a good chunk of that was occupied by Tom Baker. The continuing talk of entropy in the story could be seen as them asking, how much longer can we really keep doing this? Mind you, the story itself treats entropy more like some kind of mold or rot. Entropy is a process. It's things in the act of decaying and breaking down. But let's get back on track. The TARDIS was originally headed to Gallifrey, the Doctor's home planet, several episodes ago because the Time Lords wanted the Doctor's then-companion Romana to come back to them. Long story there, but she was a Time Lord as well, and her being with the Doctor was not intended on their parts. And she's now in another universe entirely, so the Time Lords are going to be kind of annoyed at that. She has broken the cardinal rule of Gallifrey. She has become involved 
in a pretty permanent sort of way. Ironically, in Doctor Who Expanded Universe stuff, Romana would eventually return to Gallifrey and become Lord President. Just in case you wondered if Gallifreyan politics were any less weird than here. Not wanting to deal with the bureaucracy of all that, the Doctor decides to hold off on returning home, instead electing to visit Earth. As such, we head to Earth again as we meet future companion Tegan Jovanka and her aunt Vanessa. Tegan, an Australian, was introduced to try to gain some appeal to Australian audiences. Producer John Nathan Turner was all about trying to drum up new interest in Doctor Who. And here, she's on her way to the airport to start her job as a flight attendant for Purple Airlines. Back in the TARDIS, the Doctor explains that he specifically wants to go to Earth to find a police box. I'd like to see Earth, but why go all that way just to look at something that looks like the TARDIS? I don't know, Adric. Ask all the tourists who want to go to the one in Earl's Court. I want to go to it, too. Specifically, the doctor wants to measure it. Whatever for? Block transfer computation. We're going to calculate the perfect Lego version of one. We'll explain block transfer computation a bit later. The Doctor says they'll take the measurements of the police box to the planet Legopolis. But before he can explain why... What is it? The cloister bell. Get your Ultra Balls ready, Adric. Even if it's just a shelter, it's worth it. Tegan's aunt's car gets a flat tire on the way to the airport, right near where the police box we saw at the beginning was. And then back in the TARDIS, the cloister bell suddenly stops. The doctor suspects it was a false alarm, that the TARDIS was just malfunctioning, though we never learn if that's really the case. I mean, the thing is a living time machine. It's entirely possible it was giving a warning for the seventh doctor to not step outside without checking the scanner first so he doesn't get shot to death, then suddenly realize that, oh wait, my bad, we're still a ways off from that. You know, come to think of it, it's weird that with all the stuff that the TARDIS has gone through, malfunctions, time distortions, trying to materialize on the same spot as Xanak, the spring on the fast return switch getting stuck, that it took this long for the cloister bell to finally ring. Anyway, the following scenes give a... quasi-scientific, or rather science fiction, or kind of techno babble explanation for how the TARDIS works, why it's bigger on the inside and all. The idea is that the inside of the TARDIS is actually in another dimension. The outside of the ship is the only thing that exists in our dimension, and what drives the outer shell of the TARDIS, the police box part, is the chameleon circuit, which allows the TARDIS to look like anything. Problem is, the one in the Doctor's TARDIS is broken and stuck in the shape of a police box. And he laments how he always meant to ask Romana to help him fix it, but she's gone now and they miss her. Still, the future lies this way. <sighs> Doctor, that's the way to the toilet. Anyway, enough of the character continuity and emotional development. Let's see how Tegan and her aunt are doing with changing a flat tire. Sorry, auntie. But you just don't get this sort of silly aggravation with aircraft. Spoken like someone who's never had to sit for eight hours in an airport terminal waiting for plane maintenance or had to sit in the plane while it waited on the runway for two hours during summer with the air conditioning turned off while they did the plane maintenance. Or had to fly United. Anyway, back to lore drops. It had already been established by the first Doctor that he was in exile from Gallifrey, but we never knew why. The second Doctor had stated that he left Gallifrey because he was bored, that the Time Lords had incredible power, but were just content to sit on their asses all the time and not see all the wonders of the cosmos. Here, the Doctor explains that he actually stole the TARDIS while it was in for repairs. I should have waited. I've done the comedian conversion, but there were other pressing reasons at the time. Turns out the Chancellery Guards don't appreciate when you graffiti Prydonian chapter rules on their office doors. Just as well, my granddaughter had keyed their cars an hour earlier. Yeah, this is what I mean by the mystery of the Doctor. This little detail of pressing reasons. It gives us a lot to speculate about, but no answers. And I like that. What sort of reasons would drive somebody to steal a ship and run off with your granddaughter like that, and hide from your own people? I don't know if any answer would be satisfactory for me, so I prefer the mystery it implies with it. Anyway, the Doctor reveals a keyboard hidden inside the console. What do these numbers and letters mean? It's called QWERTY, Adric. And even the Time Lords recognize what a great layout it is. It's actually controls specifically for the Chameleon Circuit, which he uses to demonstrate how they could make the TARDIS look like, say, a pyramid if they so desired. Unfortunately, that part of the Chameleon Circuit is stuck on Microsoft Paint mode. But of course, as soon as he implements it, it just immediately reverts back to being a police box. The Doctor explains that what got him thinking about finally fixing the thing is the events on Trocken with the Master. That he was able to hide from the Doctor using his own advanced TARDIS's chameleon circuit, and indeed thinking that maybe it's time he was a little less conspicuous. Adric thinks there's nothing to worry about since the Master is supposed to be dead. But since we left Trocken, 
and then the cloister bell. Wild catastrophe. Mm. It's gonna turn out to just be the TARDIS trying to shake off a parking ticket stuck on it. Tegan and Aunt Vanessa, distracted by the tire replacement, don't notice the TARDIS landing right next to the police box. We've missed! We were supposed to fall and crush those two out there! The Doctor readjusts and lands around the police box in a very well done effect where the bicycle that was leaning against it falls over in a panning shot without the police box seeming to change, despite the dangling phone clearly vanishing too. Kudos on the effects team there. Anyway, the police box is now inside the TARDIS, where they can measure it without drawing attention to themselves. It's just like the TARDIS! I hope not. I could do some unpleasant dimensional anomalies. Okay, it's way too obvious to use it, especially with this show, but now ah, what the hell. Space is warped and time is bendable. To Tegan's frustration, she discovers that the spare tire in the car is also flat. However, while the two talk, we zoom in on a mysterious white figure in the background watching these events unfold. Damn it, Clotho! First you take the green Jew Ranger, now you're going after Tegan! Back in the TARDIS, Adric is frustrated by the sheer number of measurements they need to take of the box, but the Doctor explains it's necessary for the Logopolitans for what they're gonna do. The aforementioned block transfer computation. And what is block transfer computation? Magic. Well, okay, it's a cool sci-fi concept rooted in ideas of mathematics and equations and probabilities and etc. But in the end, it's just magic. Block transfer computation allows you to create solid objects using pure mathematics. What the hell does spontaneously generating objects using Pythagorean theorem have to do with the chameleon circuit? Well, bear in mind that the outside of a TARDIS is not a hologram. It is, for all intents and purposes, something that seems to be made of wood. It can be painted, have an arrow shot into it, etc. Mind you, it's virtually indestructible and any damage or whatnot can be reset, but it's a physical object that someone can walk around, touch, interact with, etc. And yet it's also a magic door to a massive spaceship. Block transfer computation is how that's accomplished, utilizing mathematics to create solid matter. Now, how it creates matter using those mathematics is never explained. I've read a theory among some fans that the transfer part of block transfer computation takes that possibility from a parallel universe where it occurred and recreates it in this one. It's just you need all the probability equations of it occurring at all to make it happen. Though that theory wouldn't work with something brought up later about the concept. Anyway, point is, the outside of the TARDIS is the only thing that actually exists in this universe, and the Chameleon Circuit utilizes block transfer computation in creating the exterior. And while it's never said out loud what he needs the measurements for, what I'm guessing is that the Doctor hopes that the Logopolitans can use the equations to reset the chameleon circuit, get it unstuck if it had the proper model to work from. Although again, it's not said out loud that that's what'll fix it. Frankly, he's describing a software problem when I'm pretty sure it's a hardware issue. I'm not kidding, the Sixth Doctor actually did manage to fix the chameleon circuit briefly and not quite correctly before it reset again back to the police box, and he did so by fiddling with the mechanical operations rather than anything to do with block transfer computation. Anyway, enough of all this scientific talk, back again to the most important subject, the flat tires, where the two women argue over whether they should go to a nearby auto garage for help or try to wave down some help. It's the 1980s, Aunt Vanessa. No night errands. In the 70s, we could be idealists, but today... It's too expensive! Back in the TARDIS, the Doctor further explains how the Logopolitans don't even use computers to do block transfer computation. It's actually spoken out loud in a form of muttering language, a detail that both realize is quite odd when it comes to equations as complex as these. But before they can think more about it, there's some kind of instrumentation failure in the TARDIS, caused by a gravity bubble. The Doctor steps outside to see if he can find the source, and while he doesn't spot anything at first, he does see the man in white, and his entire demeanor and expression changes. The music is nicely ominous, doing the work along with Tom Baker's acting to sell that he either knows or suspects what they are, but doesn't want to look into it any further as he returns to the TARDIS. This is what I meant at the start. This sequence is only 20 seconds long from the Doctor spotting him and then going back inside, but there's this atmospheric creepiness to it that's so memorable and keeps the viewer interested, despite most of the dialogue up to now being about technical gobbledygook. Or complaining about flat tires. Inside the TARDIS, Adric wonders that the police box itself is the source of their issues and is trying to pick its lock, and apparently succeeds, opening the door. The Doctor enters first to be safe, and discovers another console room, identical to his own except darker. The ship has one bridge, 
One bridge. Get back to the TARDIS. If this is the TARDIS. The TARDIS, perhaps. One Riker. One bridge. With no other option, Tegan elects to roll the spare tire back to the auto place for help, but stops when she notices the police box. She moves to make a call on it, but the door opens and she notices the TARDIS interior, going inside to investigate. However, the police box that was in there dematerializes as well. The TARDIS doors automatically close for some reason, trapping her inside. There must be intelligent life at the end of this lot. Oh yeah, I see that lever with the big red ball at the end of it and think to myself, these guys are way beyond us! She finds what seems to be a speaker. Come in, anybody! My, ne my name's Tegan Jovanka! Did they leave in a flub? The cloister bell goes off again, leading Tegan to go deeper into the ship. Meanwhile, Aunt Vanessa notices the discarded tire and enters the TARDIS as well. Back in the police box, Adric and the Doctor proceed to go into the police box again and again. Some kind of dimensional recursion that they hope isn't infinite. Or at least isn't so far in that the lights are completely off because they keep bringing down the floodlight settings each time they go in deeper. Vanessa does not stay in the TARDIS for long, though, as our laughing figure from the start forces her out and puts a filter over the POV camera. Deciding to try to enter one last police box, the Doctor discovers, to our confusion and surprise, that he is outside the TARDIS. Why did he step outside when it's just supposed to be a TARDIS inside a TARDIS? Mm. This whole dimensional recursion thing is pretty much forgotten at this point. I guess you could say that part of the whole spatial warping and whatnot could just drop him off outside like that, but it just feels like a weird cop-out to an interesting mystery. Outside, however, he's discovered by some police who are investigating the abandoned car. When they bring him over to have a look, to his horror, he discovers... This is a weird remake of the movie Life Size. No, Aunt Vanessa was not secretly a Barbie doll this whole time. Rather, this is the Master's handiwork. And they're not dolls. At least they're not supposed to be. The Master has a device called a Tissue Compression Eliminator, essentially shrinking someone down to doll size and killing them in the process. This ends part one. Classic Doctor Who, since they were done in the style of serials, needed a hook to bring you back for the next part of the story, so they'd end on a cliffhanger. Usually the character's in some kind of danger, but in this case, the reveal that the Master is behind all this. Which is not really that big of a reveal when you remember that they mentioned him already in this story, the presence of another TARDIS, and the fact that he was just in the previous story with his new actor. Actually, that last point isn't as important. While the Master appeared in every serial for an entire season during the third Doctor's tenure, it was not standard for the rest of Classic Who's run for an enemy to appear twice in a row. Hell, there'd be multiple years in a row sometimes when a classic enemy wouldn't be seen. The Cybermen never showed up, aside from stock footage, during the third Doctor's era at all, and there was a five-year gap between the two Dalek stories for the fourth Doctor, for instance. Anyway, as we move into part two, the police decide to bring the Doctor down to the station for questioning, but Adric manages to distract them to allow them both to escape back into the TARDIS. The cloister bell is still ringing, and they, of course, spot that the police box is gone. The Doctor tries to dematerialize, but the other TARDIS inside of it is screwing it up, keeping it from moving. Fortunately, there are ways of getting more power and thrust. Adric, I'm going to jettison Romana's room. Meanwhile, over in the adventures of Superboy, Dr. Winger's opening his dimensional portal for the first time, and the contents of Romana's room come spilling out. They're able to dematerialize, and the Doctor sends Adric off to answer the cloister bell. Not sure what he expects him to do, since he didn't even know the cloister bell existed an hour ago, or where he can answer it. But whatever, the Doctor wanted him gone because he already knows the source of it. A distress call that he decides to answer. I wonder if he thought it might be from the Time Lords or something, hence his desire to have Adric out of the room. Oh, and with the TARDIS gone, I guess the original police box gets left behind somehow. Wasn't it still inside the Master's TARDIS? Anyway, Tegan makes her way to the Cloister Room, because it's the other set they had that day, and the Master's TARDIS materializes in front of her to really weird her out further. Adric soon returns, and the Doctor reveals that the message was from Nyssa, the woman I mentioned at the beginning from Keeper of Trocken. She was somehow able to contact the Doctor and inform him that her father is missing. The Doctor realizes what must have happened. Somehow, the Master escaped and took Tremus' body as his own. He must have known I was going to fix the chameleon circuit. How? You hadn't decided to do it yet. And how did he know to go for that specific one? England's not exactly tiny, and police boxes in that style had been around for over 50 years at that point. Has the Master been hanging around this one box for like 10 years, waiting for the Doctor to show up? The episode suggests that the Master read his mind, but when did he do that? Also, this line. In many ways, we have the same mind. 
Okay, there's mystery around the Doctor, and then there's just goofiness. No, they don't. The Doctor says they can't go to Legopolis with the Master inside the TARDIS, thinking that he'd cause destruction to the peaceful people there. Though what's stopping the Master from going on his own? Anyway, a remark from Adric about flushing the Master out of the TARDIS gives him an idea. Materialize the TARDIS underwater. And open the door. Uh, Doctor, the TARDIS is not the friggin' Augean stables. You can't just pour a river into it and say, well, that's that, gonna knock off for the day now. So there's a documentary on the DVD about Legopolis, the fourth Doctor's final season, etc. And the writer does talk about this stupid idea. For him, it was about the Doctor doing something so unexpected that the Master wouldn't be able to predict it. That the Doctor just wants to force the Master out of hiding, and he just kind of thought it worked with the show's internal logic. It really doesn't, like, at all. I mean, why would the Master open the doors of his own TARDIS? How does he keep himself and Adric from drowning? And most importantly from this whole thing, what's stopping the Master from just moving his TARDIS around to some other part of the ship where there will be less water, or at least as far away as possible from it? Hell, hell, let's think about this even further. How would the Doctor know that he's flushed out the Master when he's trying to swim around the console room too? It just raises too many questions. You know, another thing they mentioned during that documentary is that everyone, Tom Baker especially, liked to go to pubs and drink a lot. Sometimes during the day, so I'm wondering if that somehow influenced the writing? While the Master decides to screw around with Tegan because he's an asshole, the Doctor proceeds on this insane plan to drop the TARDIS into the River Thames and flood the whole thing, shutting down the TARDIS systems to try to keep it from frying. The TARDIS seems to hit bottom, and I guess they probably shut off the scanner so they can't look outside to confirm that, and the Doctor tries to open the doors, bracing themselves against them to try to control the water pressure, which, I don't know, seems like a bad idea since the water pressure is going to be greater than their own backs, but doesn't really matter because he realizes there's no pressure at all. When the doors open, they step outside and realize that the TARDIS accidentally landed on a boat instead of splashing down into the water. And despite establishing earlier that the TARDIS is getting better at these short hops, I guess we can't just try again ten feet to the right. The white figure, whom we will now refer to as his official name, the Watcher, is spotted by the two. The Watcher beckons the Doctor come up and he decides to go and talk to him, while Tegan, confused by the maze of the TARDIS and the taunting laughter of the Master, keeps ending up back in the cloister room until she starts crying. And I guess the Master gets bored or something and dematerializes his TARDIS away. Yeah, the Master's plans here, especially given what his actual goal is, make absolutely no sense. It's like he's just doing this to screw around with the doctor. And hey, he is the bad guy, it's just it seems the episode forgot that he needs a real reason to involve the doctor at all. And then he rematerializes, but his TARDIS has changed into a plant. Where's the door for it? Like, even the episode commented on this. You have a door there? Yes, I suppose that's useful. Well, we've got to be able to get in and out. The Doctor returns to the TARDIS, shaken by his encounter with the Watcher. He informs Adric that they're going to Legopolis. I've just dipped into the future. We must be prepared for the worst. For instance, we should remember our swim trunks when dipping into the future. With that, they set off for Legopolis, but the Doctor won't explain who the Watcher was or what he said, cryptically explaining that a chain of events has started that could unravel the universe. And thus they arrive at Legopolis, where windows are against the law and houses are made of wet sand. The Doctor comments that the satellite dish is new, and Tegan finally makes her way into the console room, wanting to know what the hell has been going on. We get to see the Logopolitans in their one style of clothing, and their makeup is a bit more subtle, in this case looking like humans from the front, but having some kind of either enlarged brain or just differently shaped head from the back. Also, in addition to all the other forms of conformity they got going for them, apparently the place is a retirement community since everyone looks to be like 70 years old. The Doctor must have contacted them in advance of his arrival since they're all gathered to meet the TARDIS. Then again, the Doctor had earlier said that the Logopolitans had offered to do this for him a while ago, so maybe they've just been doing this every day at 2 p.m. for like 12 years, and they just got lucky this time. Tegan wants to be brought back to Earth since her aunt is waiting for her. Your aunt? Woman of the white hat, red sports car? I was going to sell her on eBay! She's a collectible! 
Realizing that the Master murdered her aunt, but doesn't tell her, the Doctor now insists that she has to come with them. The Master brings his TARDIS outside, right next to all the Logopolitans, who should probably notice that a shrubbery just spontaneously appeared out of nowhere, especially because nothing else on this planet is green, and indeed steps outside to greet the leader of the Logopolitans, the Monitor. Tegan's complaints are hushed for a moment as she realizes she's on an alien planet, and the Monitor leads them to the Central Register, a place the Doctor thinks is familiar, though he's more weirded out by the presence of computers. As said earlier, the Logopolitans aren't supposed to be using technology like this. And you'd also think that an alien society of geniuses would be using something more advanced than dot matrix printers and VIC-20s. The Master, upon realizing that he probably needs a way to exit his TARDIS, changes it into a column and dematerializes again to another part of the planet. The Monitor takes the measurements of the police box and transmits the information to the rest of the Logopolitans, who begin working on the calculations using their space abacuses. However, in one person's home, the Master arrives and kills the occupant. Back in the Central Register, I can't help but notice that all these computers really are brand new. That one still has shrink wrap on it, so it turns out my TRS-80 here is actually a stealth Logopolis cosplay. While Adric finally explains to Tegan who they are and what's going on, the Monitor gives the Doctor the calculations. However, he also suddenly recalls what the satellite and the computers all are. The Pharos Project, a fictional research installation seeking out intelligent alien life from Earth and filmed at the real-life Jodrell Bank Observatory. The Monitor explains that this replica was made using block transfer computation, though he doesn't explain why. Still, the Doctor doesn't press, probably because he asks the Monitor to let Adric and Tegan stay on Legopolis while he goes off to deal with the Master, per the instructions of the Watcher. Speaking of, apparently the Watcher brought the previously mentioned Nyssa to Legopolis, and she greets Adric. So because of Tom Baker being the fourth Doctor for so long, it was felt that they needed somebody the audiences were more familiar with to ease the transition. They actually did ask Elizabeth Sladen and Louise Jameson, aka former companions Sarah Jane Smith and Leela, to come back to the show for that reason, but both declined. I suppose they could have asked Ian Martyr, who played Harry Sullivan, to come back, but... Harry Sullivan is an imbecile! So yeah, the best solution that they could think of was, okay, let's just grab a supporting character from the last serial, that'll do it. Hence, Nyssa joined the TARDIS crew. Three companions for the first time since the second Doctor. Anyway, it seems something is wrong with the data the Monitor gave him, because as the Doctor implements the equations, the TARDIS begins shrinking. You know, I hate to even suggest this, but with his propensity for shrinking things, are we sure the Master doesn't just have a giant fetish? This is our cliffhanger for part two, the third part beginning with the Monitor instructing his fellows to carry the TARDIS back to the Central Register. Oh hey, and we finally see the Master properly in the story! <laughs> At last, Doctor. At last, I've cut you down to size. <laughs> oh, this was in no way part of my plan, but sometimes you just gotta make your own fun. Anthony Ainley, as it happens, is my favorite master. It helps that much like how Sylvester McCoy was my first doctor, Ainley was the first master I saw. So there's certainly nostalgia in there. For me though, I just enjoy the many facets he can play. Sure, at times he's a goofy, cartoonish supervillain with ridiculous plans and a propensity for laughing, putting himself in disguises for no reason and just going over the top, but when he was allowed to, he could also be dark, serious, and cruel. The man had range and was just a delight to watch. Anyway, the Monitor has figured out that there's an error in the dimensioning routine, but they have to track down where the fault is. He and Adric head off to try to find it, the companion asking why they have to do it like this instead of just using a computer. The Monitor explains the block transfer computation can't be done by computer. Reality is altered by the equations used in it, hence creating objects out of nothing. Thus, the equations could alter the computer itself as it's calculating them, cause it to malfunction, or transform into like, a vending machine or something. And that's why it's unlikely that block transfer computation is just yanking something out of a parallel universe. If it's just a physical moving from one universe to another, why would the equations alter a computer that was calculating them? He explains that only a living mind is immune to that effect, probably because imagination and thought are much more malleable than something as rigid as a computer program, designed to only execute the functions it's programmed to do. 
Anyway, the Logopolitans set up some sonic projectors around the TARDIS and allow the Doctor to work on the problem from inside of it. Because, of course, sound fixes shrinkage. Of course! Don't you know anything about science? In the streets, Adric and the Monitor find something wrong with the numbers, discovering several Logopolitans who have been tissue compressed. Interfering with the working of Logopolis. The most dangerous crime in the universe. How the hell are we going to get our standardized test scores up now? Adric spots the Watcher just chilling around the streets before he's brought back to the Central Register, where they show the Doctor the numbers that are the cause of the problem. Adric thinks that the Watcher is the Master, he never actually saw the Master on Trocken, so it's easy for him to make this mistake, so he and Nyssa go out looking for him. Meanwhile, the Doctor quotes Thomas Huxley about how the world is a chessboard. And the opponent makes no allowances for mistakes nor makes the smallest concession to ignorance. Huh, it's a good line. Someone should take inspiration from that quote and plan an entire storyline of a comic book review show around it. He spots the numbers that they're trying to show and works to repair the TARDIS. Tegan decides to do some padding in this episode by suggesting to the Monitor that the people working are like a sweatshop. This goes nowhere. Maybe they were just trying to push her character as more of an activist type, but it's a pretty tiny detail in the grand scheme of things. On the streets, Nissa and Adric get separated as the Master speaks to her, claiming to still be her father. He tells her that he's on some secret mission to uncover something about Legopolis. You're so changed by it. You look younger, but... so cold. Well, that's why my outfit is so scrunchy, Nissa. It's velvet. He tells her not to reveal to anyone else that he's around, and gives her a tight bracelet to wear. Well, I say tight because she keeps saying it's hard to wear, but of course we can clearly see it's sliding up and down her arm. The TARDIS is restored, and the Doctor emerges, none the worse for wear. When he learns that Adric and Nyssa went looking for the Master, he goes after them, admitting to Tegan that the Master killed Aunt Vanessa. In the Central Register, the Master, disguised in a robe, kills the Logopolitans who were wheeling away the sonic projectors, and takes them for himself, using them on the people working there, so that they suddenly go quiet. The Master's evil scheme? Noise-canceling headphones. That's only barely a joke. As the Master moves the projectors into the main room where Tegan and the Monitor are, the Doctor reunites with Adric and Nyssa. However, they soon realize how quiet the streets have become. The Doctor realizes at last that he was never the Master's target. He's here specifically to take over Legopolis. Which pretty much makes the entirety of his activities in parts 1 and 2 completely pointless other than screwing around. I don't know, maybe he just got sick of waiting for the doctor after he took the police box and came up with a whole new scheme in his boredom. The Monitor pleads with the Master to turn off the projectors, that the disruption is eroding structure and causing entropy to form. The Master demands to know about the secret work they're doing, but the Monitor says that he can't say. The others return, and Nyssa learns that the Master killed her father. They demand he turn off the machine, that silencing the Logopolitans is killing them off, but he doesn't believe it. You exaggerate, Monitor. Logopolis is not the universe. But it is! It's very dramatic until you realize that the Monitor is actually just really geocentrist about his planet. You're interfering with the law of cause and effect. How? It's at this point where you remember that there are like five of them and they could probably just jump him and beat the crap out of him, or at least restrain him. But no, Adric just tries to pull the sonic projector away. The Master reveals that the bracelet he gave Nyssa is a device that allows him partial control over her body, which he uses to have her try to give him the Vulcan neck pinch. Oh no, no, stupid. You got it much too high. It's down here where the shoulder meets the neck. The Doctor has come to realize, probably because of the Watcher informing him, of the actual importance of Legopolis and tries to get the Master to see what he's doing, but the Master thinks he can call their bluff by turning off the projectors to demonstrate that nothing's wrong. But indeed, the projectors are off, and Legopolis remains silent. Everyone is already dead. Man, these people woke up today thinking, oh boy, I can't wait to recite the quadratic equation, and then ended up dying because they couldn't. Bummer. Going out into the streets, they find not only buildings starting to erode and fall apart, but bodies decaying rapidly. The Monitor stating that entropy has taken over. The Master thinks this whole thing is a trick, citing how none of them are dying, but the Monitor says the degradation is random. They could all go at any moment. He tries to use Nyssa against the Monitor, but the entropy wastes away the bracelet, disintegrating the thing into styrofoam. The Master believes it now, as the Monitor states that this effect is going to spread outwards. He explains that the universe was being held 
together by their equations they were constantly muttering. That the universe long ago passed the point where entropy would have overtaken everything. According to this episode, the universe is a closed system. As far as we know, it is not. That's why there's the theory of heat death, that we basically expand forever until there's no more thermodynamic energy, and thus entropy would actually decrease. And if the universe had remained closed, entropy would have long ago eaten away everything. Instead, the Logopolitans had devised a temporary plan to buy more time. The recreation of the Pharos Project and its transmitter opening up gateways into other universes that the entropy could be siphoned into. Which is actually a clever way to connect this to earlier episodes in this season. The E-Space Trilogy, as it's called, wherein the TARDIS fell into one of these gateways and was trapped in another universe for three stories and consequently where the Doctor picked up Adric. It's a cool way to build up to the season finale without being really overt about it like the modern show does. Without the Logopolitans speaking their equations, those gateways are going to close up and, well, the universe is going to be dust. This will teach you to meddle in things you don't understand! I want you to take a moment and realize that this whole thing, flat tire, bigger on the inside spaceship, travel to alien planet, her aunt died, and now the universe falling apart has been like... An hour or two for Tegan. So yeah, the universe is doomed because some old guys couldn't mumble about algebra. It's a completely absurd premise, but this episode treats the situation seriously with the atmosphere, dread, and acting carrying it through the ridiculousness of it all. And if there's one thing that makes this episode succeed above everything else working against it, it's the excellent soundtrack by Patty Kingsland. It's foreboding, haunting, and mysterious. When I'm doing any writing about horror stuff, it tends to be what I put on in the background for mood. This is synthesizer music at its best, with unique themes for Triumph, Legopolis itself, the Watcher's leitmotif, and they even threw in the Who theme a few times. But then there are two moments that are also still good, yet at the same time feel completely at odds with the rest of the score, and they're super jarring each time they happen. Like when the doctor says they're not finished yet. Math may not save the universe, but rock and roll can, damn it! The Doctor says that he and the Master need to join forces to save the universe, to the objection of his companions, considering, you know, he's a murderous, evil asshole. However, the Doctor states that they're being awfully picky about who he aligns with, considering none of them joined up with him by his choice. Nyssa begged him for his help finding her father, Tegan wandered into the TARDIS without permission, and Adric was a stowaway on the TARDIS in eSpace. The Watcher apparently got into the TARDIS and brings it to them, so the Doctor can shuffle his companions in there to keep them safe safe. Though this gives me another great opportunity to talk about a cool thing about this story, some excellent cinematography and staging. Doctor Who may have been a low-budget show, but occasionally we had some real ambition with it. They have small, cramped sound stages to work on that can be very difficult to make interesting, but in Legopolis, they take advantage of dollies, crane shots, keeping the actors moving around in interesting ways so there's always a sense of movement, even though it's very dialogue-heavy. Again, this story is really kind of nonsense, but there's so much earnestness to it and good craftsmanship that makes it compelling and interesting, and I love to revisit it! Anyway, part three ends with the Doctor and the Master shaking hands, agreeing to work together, and bringing us into the final part. The Monitor is slipped back to the Central Register, so the two Time Lords head off to collect him and leave in the Master's TARDIS. After all, he's technically the expert in what's going on. Tegan, however, also elects to stay behind because she thinks the Doctor is the only real chance she has of ever getting home. Our heroes arrive back at the Central Register, where the Monitor's trying to assemble all the research they've done. The hope was to introduce a program that would keep the dimensional gateways open permanently, take the burden off of the Logopolitan's constant equations. That being said, the research isn't complete, so they'll need to do what they can to finish it and beam it off into space. The Master is less than enthusiastic about this plan, suggesting some viable alternatives, until the Monitor is overtaken by the entropy and disintegrates via 80s video effects. Not wanting to stick around after seeing that, the Master elects to head to his TARDIS alone, but the Doctor decides not to follow him, instead opting to grab the research. I want this in pieces. Yeah, but you might want to stop the Master from leaving first before you end up in pieces, dude. Fortunately for our heroes, the Master is knocked out by some falling debris right outside his TARDIS before he can leave. Back with the Doctor... Bubble memory. Bubble memory. It's so cute how excited he gets for technology that's gonna be obsolete in five years. 
Not gonna explain what bubble memory is. It's a technical thing and not important here. Aside from the fact the program the Logopolitans were working on is stored within it, and they can just plug it into another computer and still run it. As such, the Doctor now has a plan. They'll bring the tech back to Earth to the actual Pharos project and use their system to transmit the program into the gateway. Back in the TARDIS, Adric and Nyssa witness the Watcher operating the controls to put them in the only place that'll keep them safe, taking the TARDIS outside of time and space. That means lunch won't be till yesterday. Our heroes recover the Master and take his TARDIS to Earth. Pharaoh's computer room. I envy you your TARDIS, Master. Although I don't envy the smell. After being forced to knock out the guy attending the place at night to prevent the Master from just killing him, they get to work. Back in the TARDIS, Adric explains to Nyssa how this whole thing started, wanting to repair the TARDIS because of its age. Entropy again. You can't get away from it. Your friends are currently attempting to do just that, Nyssa, and the Logopolitans were able to get away from it for eons. Maybe you should rethink that statement. The Watcher beckons Adric over to talk to him, though again, we're not privy to the conversation, only that he seems to know what's going to happen, and apparently gave him instructions. Which includes them now returning to the universe and aiding the Doctor at the Pharos Project. I'm guessing he didn't just do that right away in case things somehow didn't proceed like they were supposed to, and they'd still be safe inside the TARDIS. Nyssa turns on the scanner and observes the universe from outside of it, and in particular, a literal friggin' cloud of entropy sweeping through it. And just to really round out Nyssa's own bad day after losing her father, she watches Trocken get overtaken by it. She is now the last survivor of her people. And now the world that I grew up in... ...butted out forever. Meanwhile, the Time Lords are waking up after an all-night kegger from the party for Chancellor Barusa being elected president. They're pouring a cup of coffee, look out the window, see the entropy cloud, and go, What the hell did we miss?! I'd have to re-watch more of the early Fifth Doctor's tenure, but if I recall correctly, there really wasn't much pathos mind for Nyssa about this, even though there really should have been. It's a pretty dark thing to do, too. Consider that Keeper of Trocken was the serial right before this one. There were other characters in that, too. So now that story, all the people we saw in it, all the work the Doctor did to try to foil the Master's plan there, it can seem like it was all for naught, since they're all dead now. Anyway, the TARDIS lands outside a small model of the Pharaoh's project, while the rest of our heroes complete their work. The program is running, but they need to hook up some equipment to the antenna array for it to transmit to the gateway. The Doctor wants to use the Master's TARDIS to get there so they don't run into the guards, but he says that's not possible, since he had to disconnect equipment from it to get all this stuff running. As such, they head out on foot. And hey, remember what I said about two pieces of music that felt a bit jarring? Nothing like 70s funk Wakacha music combined with 80s synthesizer to make up some sneaking around music. The guards spot our heroes and they end up splitting up, the Master heading back to his TARDIS while the Doctor proceeds to the antenna, his companions keeping the guards distracted. When the Doctor reaches the control room, the Master's already there and finishing setting everything up. Turns out he was lying about not being able to take his TARDIS. As the Doctor finishes it up and begins transmitting the program, the Master steps aside to start recording a message. Everything looks like it's working, the program is keeping the gateway open on its own. The entropy will be siphoning off. Unfortunately, it's here where the Master reminds us of just how much of a colossal dick he is. He points out that things are still unstable at the moment. He could send a pulse into the gateway that would close it forever and allow the entropy to continue. As such, he transmits the message he was recording to the entire universe. I'm assuming using equipment from his own TARDIS. Otherwise, if he's using the same equipment that Earth was using to beam messages into space, he might want to get comfortable, because the reply might not come for a while. Peoples of the universe, please attend carefully. The message that follows is vital, vital to the future, future of you all. I would have so much respect for him if he just ended up rickrolling the entire universe instead. But no, it's an ultimatum. Make him lord of all creation, or else he'll allow the entropy to continue. Not sure why he expects this plan to work, it's not like the entire universe is going to be able to get back to him, and a lot probably don't know who the hell he is, or what's going on, or why they should believe him. I have it in my power now to save them, or destroy them. You're utterly mad! Is this the human condition of madness, leader? It is. Huh. Using that clip feels like cheating when this already is a Doctor Who episode. 
Anywho, the doctor realizes that he can stop the master from sending the pulse by disconnecting a cable outside. The master tries to stop him and they struggle, eventually the master returning to the control room and changing the angle on the satellite, which also turns the scaffolding. The doctor manages to pull the cable, but because of the angle he was at, he falls, dangling high above the ground and holding onto it. And meanwhile, at the model of the Pharaoh's project, some toy or something is dangling above the ground too. This causes a flashback of sorts. Better a lap dog to a slip of a girl than a git. He tries to go over to some of the support beams, but loses his grip and falls to the ground. Ah, just walk it off. That's what the tenth doctor did when he fell from that height. As the master escapes, the doctor's companions surround him, both here and in his memories. The doctor, still alive, tells them not to worry, that the moment has been prepared for. The Watcher shows up and merges with the doctor. He was the doctor all the time. Oh, of course! What? In the documentary on the DVD I mentioned, the writer, Chris Bidmead, explained that he wanted to try something different with the regeneration, that the Watcher himself could be a consequence of the dimensional anomalies caused by one TARDIS inside of another, or that since all the Doctors are constantly traveling around through time, altering things, being involved in events, etc., that it's just natural that a future self could become involved and witness the changes. You know, that time that the Fifth Doctor fell into some flower and then became mummified, then decided to go and remember how he regenerated before he took a shower and then merged with himself again? I should note that neither of these ideas are bad, it's just that they're not satisfactory explanations for what's going on with the Watcher. It needed some more dialogue explaining it beyond, Oh, he was the doctor the whole time! Egg on my face! I mean, the Watcher had the ability to teleport himself and others across worlds. Can the doctor do that without a TARDIS? And why does he appear here and not any other time? What were the things he said to the doctor and Adric? Why supply them with information at all? Is this altering how history originally unfolded? Why does he look like a mummy? Spinoff material has tried to explain him away as like a projection of his future incarnation, either the fifth doctor or possible future incarnations that never will be. However, even if that is the case, explaining away plot holes in expanded universe media doesn't retroactively make the original product good. It just means that the author of that expanded universe piece recognized that it was a problem in the original work and wants to fill in the hole. The original work still has the hole in it, and there's no guarantee that most viewers will be seeking out all the other pieces of media associated with it to make it work anyway. But on the other hand, he's really cool and mysterious and helps with the atmosphere, so I guess we can just shrug it off. Mostly. And so Legopolis and the Fourth Doctor era comes to a close as the Doctor regenerates into Peter Davison, with some stories to come that are wonderful and others not so much. I've pretty much already given my thoughts throughout. This story is great, even if it doesn't actually make a lot of sense. Plot holes aplenty and misconceptions about how things work dominate the story, but it really does have an epic quality to it, with a heavy emphasis on dread and foreboding as things build up, taking the most mundane task in the world, measuring something, and eventually leading into an event that could destroy the universe. The Master's big plan, figure out what Legopolis' secret is, keeps getting sidetracked by him just screwing around with people, and yet up until he switches off the sonic projectors, it feels like he's in complete control, moving two steps ahead of the Doctor and proving himself to be a worthy adversary, the successor to the Roger Delgado Master that Mr. Melty and Captain Crispy were unable to deliver on, in my opinion at least. The music is excellent, the sci-fi concepts, while not always correct, are cool and fascinating, the actors are doing their jobs well, and there are even bits of humor sprinkled in. It really does go to show that even stories with weaker plotting like this one can be saved if other elements come in to help prop it up. I'm curious to know if people would like me to try this again at some point, though hopefully with a shorter review. Even though patrons didn't vote for them, I know I'd love to cover State of Decay and Invasion of Time at some point. I love how this review, talking about a universe-ending threat, kinda works great for us to lead into next time, Event Comics Month 4. And we'll start things off with Armageddon 2001. <laughs>
This your vehicle? Which vehicle? Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!